Our gospel lesson this morning is from Luke chapter 14, beginning in verse 25. Listen for God's word that is for you in this day. Now large crowds were traveling with him, and Jesus turned and said to them, Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brother and sisters, yes, and even life itself, cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not first sit down and estimate the cost? see whether he has enough to complete it. Otherwise, when he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it will begin to ridicule him, saying this fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to wage war against another king, will not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000. If he cannot, then while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, none of you can become my disciple if you do not give up all your possessions. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It's 6 a.m. Monday morning and things start off quickly. At 6 to 9 a.m., these three hours are for breakfast and extreme weight training, followed by two meetings. Everyone goes to meetings. There's one at 9 a.m. that's everyone together and then 10 a.m. for specific groups, and then comes the most important part of the day, the main practice, from noon to 2 o'clock. There's probably time for lunch after that from 2 to 2.30, but you can't stop now. From 2.30 to 3, there's public relations and interviews, then time for follow-up meetings before dinner. Most leave after dinner, yet... They take stuff home to study and review. And this is just a sample of a typical day for an NFL football player. (laughs) That's what your days look like, right? (laughs) A normal, typical Monday. Yet I imagine for the Eagles and the Vikings, the Jaguars and the Patriots, 2018 has not had many of these normal days but their days might be even more intense as they have one specific goal. Not only to get to the Super Bowl, but to win it. You gotta win, right? So today they'll show up, all four of those teams to play and see if they can make it to win one more game and get one step closer to the goal. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm not a morning person. I really can't comprehend waking up at 6 a.m. six days a week, yet alone to get up and start working out. For me, 2018 began a new journey of marriage, and that journey began with lots of late mornings in Paris. In fact, some of them weren't really mornings at all. We missed those. Parisians are late night people anyway. But my first strenuous act of the day would be to put on my boots and a coat and to go down four flights in the elevator (laughs) and walk half a block to the boulangerie where I discovered that my new favorite breakfast is a pan au chocolat et almond, which is a chocolate croissant that also has almond in it, because why not? 2018 didn't start with a usual rush to the gym or reconsideration of food plans. But those things are entering the to-do list now. (laughs) Yet, as Troy and I arrived back in Pennsylvania after a wonderful wedding day in California and a wonderful time in Paris, I started to realize that in the midst of all that has gone on in my life, 
a new year has started. Now, we may not be NFL players beginning a new year with the Super Bowl, but we also have choices to make on what we will focus on, train for, even sacrifice for. Otherwise, it can be just one of those years that goes by and we look back and say, what happened? I think this is really what Jesus is talking about in Luke 14. As you look at this passage, realize that he's not talking to his disciples. Jesus is talking to those other people who showed up and hung out on the edge of the crowd. They showed up because Jesus had become popular, because they wanted to see what happened next. They wanted to see something amazing. I don't think they were expecting this harsh language any more than we are when we read it. And it's passages like this when I am very thankful that we get to the end and you all do indeed proclaim, this is the word of the Lord, thanks be to God. Some of the passages are difficult. They say things that we are not sure what that really means. But as Jesus turns to this large crowd, to these people who've shown up to see something miraculous, he says, whoever comes and does not turn away from their family, who does not turn away even from one's own life, cannot be my disciple. This isn't something we can do halfway or just a little bit. And so he talks about someone who might build a tower. But of course, before you build it, you'd have to sit down and figure out the plans and the cost and arrange for the funds. Or else you might build it and have part of a wall that everyone could see when they go by as a symbol of there's someone who starts things, but they can't finish. They can't get through the whole project. Or can you imagine being a ruler in a conflict and before you send people into battle, certainly you'd stop to assess the resources to see if there was enough. If there wasn't, wouldn't you send out the fastest messenger you had with a white flag? It certainly seems like it'd be a better choice. And then this passage ends with Jesus saying, None of you can be my disciples unless you give up all that you have and all that you want. This isn't about living in a void where nothing matters. Jesus is asking, will you choose me to be the main thing? Because a life of faith can't be half a tower or a battle you jump into and out of like it's a video game. Following Jesus is a choice, it has to be carefully considered, and one that should affect everything else in your life. Because it means we're willing to turn to Jesus first, before anything else, before our own success, before our plans and desires, before even our families. This is what Jesus is saying. In the midst of all that we do, to be a disciple, we must make Jesus the main thing. So what does it look like to be a disciple? Maybe it's not unlike a highly trained athlete that requires commitment and practice and dedication and a willingness to want what God wants. I'm not going to pretend that this is easy or simple or something you decide and it just happens. Our Old Testament lesson for the day gives us Jonah and it's almost this anti-story to this theme. For here is a man who'd heard the voice of God and who was known for this. He was known as a prophet. It was this exalted position. But to keep it, you had to keep hearing the voice of God. And so thankfully, I'm sure with a bit of relief, another day comes where the voice of God returns 
But it doesn't say what Jonah expects or even likes. God says, go to Nineveh. And Jonah chooses to turn the other way and run as far as possible in whatever way he can. But he finds you can't hide or outrun God even at the bottom of the sea where God sends a big fish to carry Jonah safely, but certainly not pleasantly, to the beach that of course happens to be closest to Nineveh. And then again, God says, go and give my word to the people of Nineveh. So he does. Jonah goes with as little effort as possible. He says, 40 days more, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. I've heard this described as the worst sermon ever. There's no hope. Anyone get any hope in that? There's no good illustrations. There's no catch. There's nothing that makes you laugh. But it was a word from God. So none of the rest of it mattered. And the people heard that. And they are the ones that turn to God with all of their hearts, even the animals. And as they turn and cry out to God, putting God first, God's grace comes. But Jonah, if you read farther into chapter 4, Jonah is angry. He doesn't agree that these people deserve God's grace. He wants things done another way. In fact, the way he would choose to do it. And so this book of prophecy ends with God asking Jonah a question. And I think is a question for all of us. And the question is essentially, why do we judge God's actions? when really we are angry that God has not done what we would do? Will we choose to turn to God first, before our own goals, before our own dreams, before our own desires? What does it mean to be a disciple? It means to follow Christ first and to seek God and to be willing to do what it is that God wants. Be willing to take that ticket that doesn't tell you what the destination is. Be willing to realize that God's way may not be what we expect, but yet it is right. Even if it means mercy for our greatest enemies. So what does it look like? What does it look like in every day to choose to make Jesus the main thing in one's life? What does it look like to live into Luke 14 instead of just wishing that some other passage had been chosen for the day? What does it look like to want what God wants? Well, perhaps it looks like a man named Patrick who after being taken from his home in Scotland, put into slavery, and somehow manages to escape and get back to Scotland, where he's ordained in the church, who then chooses to follow the compulsion of his dreams and go back to that land where he was enslaved, go back to Ireland and make Christ known. Perhaps it looks like Corrie Ten Boom, who after speaking of her experience in a concentration camp and how God was present, finds herself meeting someone in the audience and coming face to face with one of the guards who happened to be down that hall in the very camp she was held in. And he'd been listening. And he'd heard the truth of the words, and he was turning to God, and he reached out her hand, and she chose to take it. Finding a way without any words to say, this is God. 
And as their hands connect, the warmth and the love of God somehow comes through this painful handshake in a moment that offers unexpected healing. Or perhaps it looks like Father Gregory Boyle in a church in downtown L.A. as he encounters one who comes back home to the projects. He has a nice car and he now has nice clothes and he looks around at the church and he sees gang members over there by the bell tower. He sees homeless men and women being fed in the parking lot. He sees other people arriving and going in the building for ESL classes and AA meetings. He starts shaking his head, seeing in judgment what he thinks is good and right and says, this used to be such a nice church. Yet Father Boyle, seeing as Christ would see and wanting what Christ wants, replies, you know, most people around here think this finally is a church. People of God, 2018 stretches out before us, and Luke 14 gives us a compelling challenge. Will we make Christ the main thing? Will we live into, will we seek what God wants first? Scripture tells us, seek ye first the kingdom of God and the righteousness of God, and all these things will be added unto you. O oh Lord, help us. Help us to seek you. Help us to seek what you want today and every day. Help us to turn again and again so that you might be first. Amen. Amen.